All right, Acts 13, we're going to talk about the difference between Saul and Paul being the same man, obviously, but we're going to talk about it. Uh, in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and uh, Simeon that is called Niger and Lucius Serene and many in, which have been brought up with Herod to teach rock <clears throat> and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted the Holy Ghost said separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them now this is a pivot point in the book of Acts this separation has to do with separating Paul's preaching from Peter's preaching. As I, it appears that it, and it is actually the first time you do hear the true reality of the uh, gospel, not stated like 1 Corinthians 15, but stated in uh, Acts 13, 38 and 39, which we might read in a minute. But uh, Saul is a individual that uh, is converted by water baptism. Uh, people say, I don't believe that. Well, Paul got baptized because no one knew the gospel of Christ. And he got the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the gift of the Holy Ghost taught him. And he said so very clearly, 1 Corinthians 2, which uh, the Holy Ghost teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Uh, I don't care where Paul got the gospel. That doesn't make any difference. And I don't care where people want to make the body star or want to make this or want to make that. I know that Paul received the gospel. I know that in him first was a pattern. Those are the words that Paul used. I know that Paul's name is Saul is not called Paul until Acts 13. Now, he didn't have a name changed. Look at Acts 13. This is what it says. Verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, who also is called Paul. So there have been people that call him Paul. And uh, the Lord now is, from this point on, is calling Saul Paul. Okay. We know that Paul, uh, look in Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1. I might have made it a little hard last night for the pandemoniums. I'll try to slow down and get this. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. Okay, hold on. Go with me to uh, Philippians. The book of Philippians chapter 3. Let's see this religion. Philippians 3, 4, verse uh, 3, chapter 3, verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh he have where he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day, that means he's in the covenant, of the stock of Israel. And uh, you'll find that his message in Acts 13 states this a little different uh, about who he's going to. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But he said of the stock of Abraham, of uh, the stock of Israel, Paul John, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of the Hebrews, a touching law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, uh, touching uh, the righteousness which is the law of blame. All right, he's a Pharisee. We have that now in recorded. He's a Pharisee. Go back to Galatians 1.13. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. Pharisee. Okay. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted. Now the Pharisees didn't like the church of God. And the church of God believed the gospel of God that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And their message was the message of circumcision. It was a gospel of the circumcision. The good news of the circumcision. What? God was not going to hold them accountable for the killing of the Lord. He forgave them for Christ's sake. If they will repent, change their mind about it, be baptized, 
Walk, uh, be uh, be baptized. Call, uh, uh, repent. Be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the gift of the Holy Ghost would be able to teach and show things, but it also give power. There, there's a lot of things involved in that Holy Ghost there in Acts. But the the legal sides of this is that Saul, the the young man, uh, obviously Saul is a he's a young man. Uh, look with me. If, uh, I don't know if I want to do this right now. I'm I'm going to hold off on it just for a second. Uh, Galatians chapter one again. <clears throat> he's a Pharisee. Now that's an upper level. But not only is he a Pharisee, he's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now that could be associated with his teaching, obviously. Look in uh, Galatians chapter 1 verse 14. Profited in the Jews' religion. So the Jews' religion is very profitable to him. And uh, thus we see that this, this religion uh, back in uh, 13... The Jews' religion, the religion was a profitable one. Well, we know that hadn't changed, even though it's went to Gentiles now. They're very profitable in religion and so forth. But he says, uh, above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. So his religion is tradition. And Paul knows this now. He knows it's not the true religion of God. He knows it's a traditional religion. And verse 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. Now, he's not talking about his birth there. He's talking about his separation from the Jewish religion because that was his mother. That was his alma mater. That was his teaching. He, he was separated from it. Now, how did, that, how did that work by separation? Let's go to Acts 2. And a lot of people don't want to believe that Paul got baptized, but I believe he did what he was told to do by Ananias, and we'll read that all that in just a second. But in Acts chapter 2, look with me in uh, verse 40. Well, you understand the gospel of circumcision is 238. I'll go ahead and read that. Then Peter said unto them who... Uh, verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. I mean, <clears throat> from Acts 2 to 10, Peter wouldn't go to anybody but uh, Jews lost to get the lost sheep. He wouldn't go to anybody but the house of Israel. And if his message is the good news, the gospel of the circumcision, what is their good news? I mean, let's think about that. What is their good news? Their king, they killed and he's gone. How could they have good news? What would be the good news? Well, the good news is, would he return? But wait a minute. The Jews as a nation as a whole don't believe he ever came. They just believe he was a prophet, a man. They don't believe the Son of God came because if they believed the Son of God came, they'd have to see they had crucified him, but God had raised him, and they would have to get baptized. Because that's the question it was asking, actually, with men and brethren, what shall we do? Uh, and Peter didn't tell them, well, you need to trust the gospel of Christ and believe that he has sealed you and that you've been glorified, you're complete in Christ. All that. He ain't saying that. He don't know that. What he knows is that these Jews, this nation, all has to be preached to. Why? Pentecost is the day. That's a great day to preach. Why? They're all there at Pentecost, the males. And the males are Jewish. They're not Gentiles. There's no Gentile nations. They're, they're not allowed there. This is not a message to Gentiles. You understand that baptism is not a message to Gentiles unless they have been Jewish proselytes or religious proselytes, which are ones that follow the Jews. And you see that later in, in Cornelius. But you understand, these, Je these Jews have got to repent. they got to change their mind about Jesus or there's no good news to them. 
And so the good news is that Peter says, repent and be baptized. They warn you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God would give them the gift of the Holy Ghost, even though they killed, even though they denied his son, Jesus Christ. Now that's forgiveness. That's mercy. And that's the mercy of remission to, Gen uh, to the Jews. The Jews have a chance to repent and get baptized. Peter explains this in 1 Peter. If they do, then they're born again. They're, it's begotten again. They're born again, Acts, uh, 1 Peter 1, And being born again, they're dead to sins, not sin, because they can die. They can die for sin, according to 1 John. Because if any man sees sin, uh, a brother sins a sin which is not a death, he shall ask, give him. But if he sends a sin unto death, there's a sin unto death. What is, what's Matthew 12? It's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So the people that got the Holy Ghost by repentance and water baptism still have that problem looming over them. If they blaspheme, there is no forgiveness neither in this world or world to come. And so they're very, they got to tell the line. They've got to endure to the end on and on and on. We're not going to get into that. But when you think about Paul, Paul got baptized. People say, I don't believe he did. Well, let's just see. Acts 22. Paul, there's another account coming out about Paul, and it's about him and Ananias. And Acts 22, uh, verse 12. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, okay, now here he, that's how he knew him, Saul, okay, Brother Saul, receive thy sight, and the same hour I looked up upon him. Remember, Saul is blind. Now we're, we're dealing with Saul right now, so I'm not even going to really deal with Paul in the sense of that. Saul is blind. The Lord appeared to him, and he can be appeared to because of the change of the message that's coming. Uh, let me see if I can get something here. Hold on to Acts chapter 22. Look in Acts uh, uh, Galatians. No, I pause it. Timothy, that would be better. This, this would be a better account. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He got forgiveness. How did he get forgiveness? Christ enabled him. Christ appeared to him, told him what to do. Okay, go to Acts 22. Let's see what he told him to do. Verse 14. And he said, the God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will, see that just one, and just hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And why tarriest thou, arise, be baptized, wash away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Okay? What am I supposed to think Paul did? Turn to Acts 9. In Acts chapter 9, the, the account of the appearing of the Lord to Paul, uh, uh, Saul, here it goes. Verse uh, 15, no, let's go to 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on the name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentile, the kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Okay, now, over 22 again. In Acts 22, verse 10. Uh, or verse 9. 
And they that were with me saw indeed the light were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, arise, go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee, bless your soul all things which are appointed for thee to do. All things that Paul had to do to get ready, you understand, to get ready for what his ministry was going to be. Well, first, Acts 2. This has to happen. Now, I guarantee you, Saul, as a young man, when the Lord appeared to him and settled the issue of who he was, Saul is in a repentant mode. And the reason is, he believes that Jesus is raised from the dead. He's the son of God. And he preached it. Uh, also get Acts 9. Get to Acts 2 and Acts 9. Now, here's what happened to Paul, Saul, just like happened to those Jews in Acts 2. Saul didn't do it in Acts 2, but he did it in Acts 9. Now, watch. Verse uh, 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, I want you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, the gift of the Holy Ghost Got to hold on. Go to Hebrews. All right. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 4. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they should fall away to renew them again under repentance. Okay. That's where your blasphemy against the Holy Ghost comes in. The ones that repented in Acts chapter 2 got baptized, got the heavenly gift. They tasted the heavenly gift. They received the, the thing that the Holy Ghost would do, right? Well, in getting baptized, they turned from the untoward generation. Look in verse uh, 40. And with many other words did he uh, did he testify and exhort, saying, "Save yourself from this untoward generation." Okay. Now Paul is separated from the untoward generation. He's separated from his mother, the uh, religious thing that he's in. Remember, he's a top dog. He's not just the everyday uh, souls that were at Pentecost. This is a top dog. This is a Hebrew of the Hebrews. This is a Pharisee. And Pharisees had their belief. We'll get into that in just a minute. But uh, So he has turned from this untoward generation by a repentance, by an appearing. Now, he kicked against Peter. He kicked against the Lord when he was on earth. He kicked against Peter. He kicked against um, uh, Stephen. And then he couldn't kick against the Lord when he appeared to him. The Lord made it where he saw it. I mean, he realized who he was. And so... As a individual, Saul of Tarsus, this is what he preached. In Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes that had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Now, you don't have to rise to get spiritual baptized, but you have to rise and go somewhere and get baptized in water, okay? So he's not standing in water when uh, Ananias comes to see him or whatever, okay? Now, verse uh, 19. And when he received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And remember, the, there are disciples at Damascus long before Paul is separated Acts 13 even. Okay, now on. And Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in a synagogue that he is the Son of God. Now that's his repentance. And, and it's an absolute turn to Romans chapter one and watch. And this is what Paul said in Romans chapter one. Okay. In Romans chapter one, verse one. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Yes, he was. He was separated under the gospel of God. That's the first thing he preached in Acts chapter nine. And he did it because he had the Holy Ghost. 
He got it when he was water baptized. And I hear people say, I don't want I don't want Paul baptized. How do I how do I get my, out from under the fact that my apostle was baptized and I don't? Because Paul wasn't sent to baptize. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 17 and 18. He did a few of them, and the Lord stopped him. He said, uh, I didn't send you to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Because in the separation, Paul uh, knows what the gospel is. Again, it does not matter to me if he got the gospel in Acts 9 uh, uh, through 12 somewhere. It does not matter to me. I know he got it. Galatians chapter 1 confirms that. I never received it of man, neither was it taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Ananias did not give it to him. Peter couldn't give it to him. None of the men around him could give him the gospel. The Holy Ghost showed it to him. They gave him to him out of the scripture. All right. Now, again, in Acts 9, he said, uh, uh, verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ and the Son of God, the Son of God. Roman, and that's the gospel of God. And he laying on Peter's foundation. But Paul said he never laid on another man's foundation. When he separated, that happened. Acts 13, he began to preach on another foundational truth. And it is according to the prophets and the, uh, the uh, scriptures. Yes, Jesus Christ is the son of God. You can't, you can't imagine receiving Jesus Christ, your son of God, uh, receiving him as your savior unless you knew who he was. Okay. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 2, which he had uh, promised before by the, his prophets, by the Holy Scripture, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. There it is. Why is Jesus Christ, Son of God, raised from the dead? But also remember, now this is a, it's a catchy phrase in 2 Timothy chapter 2. You, you wonder why he said it the way he did. 2 Timothy 2, 7, consider what I say and the Lord gives the understanding of all things. Remember, remember Timothy, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Okay? According to Paul's gospel, we have to realize that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Turn to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. But it went please God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Okay? With this calling, Paul's going to preach to the heathen, and he's not going to ask Peter or any of them men what to say. He doesn't have to go to a school and get taught. He's got the goat teaching him uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is God. Now here it comes, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual the ghost taught Paul. It delivered. Paul delivered, but he delivered because he received. I never received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that revelation could go from the appearing and the knowledge. And there's one thing you can guarantee that Paul's message will save you and if you look at it more like through Timothy doing his work and rightly divided, you can see coming to the knowledge of the truth. And we're not going to get into that tonight. It, it's obvious, but a lot of people don't believe it. That's okay. I'm not their judge. But in Acts chapter 9, Saul is preaching Jesus is the Son of God. He's the very Christ. He's right. And he's a witness. He said, I saw him. He's raised from the dead. Okay, but he also says in verse 23, uh, 2, Acts uh, 9, 22, but Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews, which were at uh, Damascus again, the saints at Damascus, the Jews at Damascus. Um, 
proving that this is the very Christ. Okay, the very Christ. Well, then the message is still repentance. And this repentant message is going to start opening up in different ways. Uh, obviously, in a after Acts uh, 7, where they are stoning Stephen, in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter uh go back to you can go back to Acts 7. They they stoned Stephen. Saul is there. Uh, look in Acts 7. We understand how old he is. In Acts 7, verse uh 58, and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name is Saul. Chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto the, his death. He, he wanted Stephen dead. He doesn't agree with Stephen. So if you read what Stephen preached, Paul didn't agree with that. And there's so he's kicking against the prick there, the prick of Stephen. He's kicked against the fleshly Jesus living on the earth for 33 years. He kicked against that prick. He don't believe that. Uh, I'm sure he's with the Jews when they said, we have no king but Caesar crucified. He kicks against that because he don't believe this. And obviously then when Peter preaches, he does not believe that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. He's just like the rest of the Jews. He believed that somebody stole his body and they're trying to uh, start a new cult with Peter, denying uh, Saul's religion, you know, his religion, Jewish religion. And it aggravates Saul to the point that he becomes a persecutor of it, injurious, dangerous to those people that repent and get baptized, that, that truly believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it, that's three kicks right there. Uh, he's, he kicks. Uh, he kicked against the fleshly, uh, the life of Jesus. He kicked against the uh, crucifixion. We have no king but Caesar. He kicked against uh, Peter's message of the fact that he's raised from the dead and that they can repent. He's not about to repent and be baptized. Obviously, Paul falls into the category of Mark 16. He that believeth and is baptized should be saved, but he that believeth not should be damned. Well, Paul was damned at that time until the Lord appeared to... You got to understand that <clears throat> no doubt the gratitude of Paul in so many things that the Lord forgave him of and when he said chief of sinners you understand we're still, we're talking about some chief sinning here we're talking about the the fact of the chief sinners when he said of whom i chief uh look back at first timothy again uh in first timothy <clears throat> chapter one again Verse 15, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Chief. And this guy's kicked against the bricks against the Lord himself. He don't believe him. He's an untoward generation Jew. He kicks against him being the king, the Messiah. We have no king. Kill him. Okay. Those two are together. Then when he's raised and witnessed by Peter and them, when Peter and them begin to preach, he kicks against this. He ain't about to trust the fact that Jesus raised from the dead. He ain't about to repent or get baptized for remission of sins. He said as touching the righteousness which is the law blameless. Why would he stand there and think he needed to repent and get baptized? Why well, he said as touching the righteousness of the law blameless, persecuting the church. So his mindset's not changed in Acts chapter 2. Something's going to have to drastically happen to this Saul, this young man, to change his mind because he is set to persecute and to injure and to do whatever is necessary to get rid of these people because he don't believe this. He don't believe it at all. Well, the Lord appeared. Uh, in uh, Acts 9. I heard a man say one time that when the Lord appeared to him, <clears throat> that Saul knew who it was. Well, that's kind of dumb. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. As Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Remember, in his mind, as touching the righteous with your law blameless. 
He believes that's a cult. That's a that's a lie. That Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ wasn't Messiah. We didn't kill our Messiah. Would we kill our Messiah? He was just a prophet and a man. Okay. Verse two, and desired to him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if any were found of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound under Jerusalem. He's not. He's not a saying. I'm just going to bring them in. Any men or women? It says. Okay. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell on the earth, I uh, fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying in him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? That's the young Pharisee, the young man, that is the zealot, that is a man who was circumcised the eighth day, a Benjamite, a, uh, a Pharisee, uh, Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, as touching the righteous law of blame, but he, he he had no need for Jesus' preaching. Isn't that amazing? While Jesus on earth, he had no need for his preaching because his mother, his religion, had taught him well. Uh, that's how you run into people on the street. They don't really need the preaching of Jesus through the Apostle Paul because they're a member of a church. They got baptized. They're, they're part of an organization. And so they don't need... They're not lost. If they were lost, they'd have to have help. You understand in Acts chapter 2, the power of the ghost with Peter preaching, those people, those men of Israel that are going to turn from that untoward generation by repentance and water baptism need something. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? I mean, you got people real confident and, and think because they go to church and everything, they will all be all right. That is not going to make them all right. Going to church, being water baptized, uh, uh, going to, uh, on a regular basis, uh, doing the Lord's Supper, all that stuff, that doesn't mean a thing to God. Not in the dispensation of grace. It has nothing to do. And then I hear people say, well, I, I'm going to get water baptized just at cleansing of the flesh. Water baptism saves. You have to separate the doctrine of water baptism who it saved, how it saved, and when it'll save them, versus are we saved already? Yes. And that'll be the Apostle Paul we'll deal with it later. Right now we're dealing with Saul. Saul's a denier of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. So you got in Acts chapter 9, he said, uh, verse 5, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, and thou persecutest hard for thee to king against the pricks. The pricks. Prick of Jesus on earth. Prick including the cross, prick of Peter's message, Acts 2, men uh, let all the house of Israel, all males appeared at Pentecost, and then the prick of Stephen. I mean, he ain't going to believe what Stephen preaches, and he's he consenting unto his death. And consenting unto his death means he don't believe what Stephen preached either. But the glorious thing about Stephen is he prayed for those stoning him. And that shows up in 1 John. If a man see his brother sin a sin which is not a death, he shall add the prayer. And you'll find that there's prayers through the Bible. Jesus prayed, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass me, never let my will, but thy will be done. And then on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Stephen, Acts 7, you stiff neck on the circle of the ears. They took him out and stoned him. Paul, Saul, little Saul, young man Saul, holding her clothes and sending him to his death. And Stephen prayed for him. You understand? He prayed for him. That means that God can do something. He enabled. He's enabled. Jesus enabled him. And he counted him faithful. That means that Paul's faithful to the end. And we see that in the later parts of his letters. But now watch. Um, he has the bragging rights of who he is, his heritage. Uh, the kicking against the bricks is Acts 2. Uh, he won't come out of the untoward generation because he's, uh, he's part of the untoward generation. So later on, he's going to have to be separated from the untoward generation. Uh, the Second, 
the second brick against it is Acts 2, 22. Uh, looking at Acts 2. I mean, Saul of Tarsus here. He's a Jew, Benjamite. He's a Pharisee. He's going to be here at Pentecost. Acts 2, 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracle wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken him by wicked hands and crucified and slain. If he doesn't get water baptized here, he's kicking against the bricks. And he doesn't. He kicks. So then you go to Acts 7. And in Acts 7, you've got Stephen preaching. And <clears throat> look with me in verse 54. When he heard this, things were cut to heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God, Jesus standing on the right hand. Again, standing, that is a fine point there. He is not seated. Standing and <clears throat> said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran upon him one accord, and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice Lord lay listen very carefully lay not this sin to their charge and he said this he fell asleep there's a man asking for Saul just Take the rest of them out of the picture up. There's a young man asking the Lord to not hold what's being done to the charge of Saul. I told him last night, there's something about Saul, I think the Lord saw that. I think he sees it about all true grace believers. There's something wrong in religion. And you may have done your religious thing, and but there's something just wasn't right. Now, that doesn't mean you're saved. And if you pulled out of the church because it wasn't right, that doesn't mean you're saved. But you would have a greater chance if you came out of the church, whether it's by anger or jealousy or an argument with somebody in there, or you didn't like somebody, there, or you didn't like what the preacher was saying, or you didn't like the preacher, blah, blah, blah. You come out, and God might just send a witness to you. What's amazing about Saul is he had a personal witness, Jesus himself. And I think that we can count that to a lot of things. Like in 1 Thessalonians, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. The Lord himself is coming after his own body that's here on earth, that's alive. And he came personally to Saul. And when I say came, he, he appeared to him. I don't know where he was at. I don't know how he was, where he was above Saul or whether he was in the room of Saul with him blind. I, I don't know. But it's a light. And we know that Jesus is the light. And he appeared to him personally. So you think about Old Saul may have had a question or two arise in his heart, which it appears most people, if they ever begin to doubt religion they're in or doubt it or see that, hey, this ain't working. What's the answer, Lord? And they're calling on the God they don't know. Well, Paul and a, any faithful man that's following Paul is going to show you who God is. God is the creator of heaven and earth. God inspired by scripture, the scriptures. You have the holy scriptures to look at. And God, his testimony is given to us through faithful men that teach. And I tried and I, my greatest desire is to be faithful all my life with the message of the gospel. But in this sense, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, this young man, He's not stoning Stephen. He's holding the clothes. 
And he also has letters later on. So maybe there's something that the Lord saw. He said, he counted me faithful. Now, Saul was a faithful man as Benjamite, as a Pharisee, no doubt. So maybe the Lord saw that if Saul was presented the appearing, he would be faithful. He did. He said he was. He said he did. And so the Lord chose Saul of Benjamin, who later on declared all the religious things he did, the circumcision, the <clears throat> the uh, keeping the law of Pharisee, the, you know, those things he counted but dumb. Now, you're not going to find many religious people that will declare their tithes, their offerings, their baptism, they're going to church or whatever they're doing, or the preachers in there. What they do is dumb. And the reason is they don't see it to be that way because they don't see the conversion of this man, young man, Saul, who is also called Paul, and his ministry that he begins in Acts 13. People say, you think his ministry began in Acts 13? Not only do I think it, I can read it, Acts 13 again. We know that he and Barnabas had a ministry in Acts 12 of delivering bounty, and no doubt, showing people who Jesus Christ was, the Son of God, the, the Gospel of God. But in chapter 13, verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein I have called them. So they're doing a work in Acts 12, all the way back to 9. They're doing a work that man could show them what to do. I mean... Paul, a Saul of Tarsus, went and visited Peter for 15 days, and I'm sure they talk about Peter's gospel. They talk about a lot of things. I can't go into what it says because I can't go in that. Um, hey, I don't know what the conversation between Peter and, and Saul was, but I also know something. Um, turn with me to Galatians. Another thought. In Galatians chapter 1, Verse 1, Paul. Not all. Okay? Galatians 2. <clears throat> Galatians 2, 1. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Took Titus with me also. Well, Barnabas and Paul, here we go, uh, took Barnabas with me uh, and Titus. Barnabas is still with him, and Paul, Saul, and Barnabas have been separated for a the, the work which God called him. And, and by the way, 13, go back to chapter 13, here's the work. So God separated, okay, wait a minute, let's go back. The Holy Ghost, I apologize. The Holy Ghost separated Barnabas and Saul for the work where any called them, but must be a special work. And in separating them, now Paul is referred to, Saul is referred to as Paul. In Galatians chapter 1, he said, Paul, uh, an apostle. And he tells in Galatians 2 in that, that he is, uh, it goes up 14 years later and shows Peter the gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. So Peter doesn't know it. Why? Because Saul is separated in Acts 13 from Peter. He's separated from that foundation that's being laid. And he's not going to lay on another man's foundation. That means he's not going to the same housing area. If you lay it, lay it out in plain words. You've got foundational buildings all around. And a man that's been building there, he said, I want you to go over there and start another subdivision different than this one. You know, a lot of subdivisions are built and all the houses look alike. They may move the door back and forth to change some things, but they look alike. But what if a man's been building on that? And he said, all right, I want you to go over to the other side of town, a new subdivision, the roads are laid, and I want you to lay the foundation there with your building of, uh, uh, abilities. Well, that's what Paul is about. 
He's not going to lay on another man's foundation. And in Acts 13, here's what he said in verse 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham. See, he said he was of the stock of Israel. Here, the stock of Abraham is Ishmael and Isaac. That's all men. And that's the beginning of their hatred for him. There's no doubt about it. And uh, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God to you is the word of this salvation sent. This salvation must be different than what Peter is doing. And if Paul never laid on a foundation, over here at this subdivision, Peter's laying a foundation for the Jews to live in. But over here, Paul's laying a foundation for those that fear God, those that are of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever they can go in there and live i mean kind of a simple illustration but you can think about it that way so here he goes out men and brethren verse 13, 26 acts 13 26 men and brethren children of talk abraham and whosoever among you feareth god to use the word of this salvation sent now look in verse 38 be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, stock of Israel, who serve for God. Therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. Okay, you got a subdivision over here that Peter builds. They got remission. You got a subdivision over here that Saul's building, and they got forgiveness. They're living in the house of forgiveness. These are living in the house of remission. Why? Because the house of remission is going to go through the tribulation if it is not taken out of the way. And it is because of the body of Christ. The tribulation could have started at any time in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, but it didn't. Why? God began to open the door to people, and he's got this man Saul, this young man Saul, who is a haughty individual, but yet he's got something about him that God saw. And when God saw it, he, his son appeared to him, showed him who he was. Saul began to preach that he was the very Christ. Preached to him that because he was the son of God, he was the very Christ. He's raised from the dead. And when his message changed later on in his life, I believe that's why he told Timothy, consider what I said, Lord, give the understanding all that. Remember, Jesus Christ of the seed of David He's raised from the dead according to my gospel. You have to have the resurrection in Paul's gospel or you're still in your sins. That's 1 Corinthians 15. The resurrection, the power of his resurrection is that you're forgiven. Now remember, here's a message of forgiveness from Saul, who's called Paul, Acts 13, who's been separated for a ministry that the work, but uh, I apologize, I want I didn't want to go without this. A work. Look with me in Acts 13, 39. And by him all the believer justified from all things which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Okay. Verse 41. No, 40. Beware, therefore, that that lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, you despisers and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you, ye, shall know in, know in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Boom. That's Habakkuk 1 5. And Paul's Isaiah 49 6 is fixing that. He's fixing to quote that in verse 46 and 47. And you see that the Jews here and the stock of Abraham, the Jews here are. Not going to believe what Saul said. Number one, why would they take Jesus as their forgiveness? And two, are you telling me that the law no longer condemns us if we break it? And that's what he just told them. This salvation that I got from the Lord, you're justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And buddy, that comes up in Romans 3, verse 20, 19, 20, 21 in that area. So here you got it. And so he says that that work he's doing is the work the Lord gave him, which matches Acts 13, 2. Uh, look in verse 13, 2. As they ministered uh, in the, to the Lord, 
and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein I've called them. Don't worry. There it is. So they have not been doing this work. That's, I mean, not separated anyway. That's all I can read into it. So then I go back to Acts 13, 30, uh, uh, 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it's necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. That's the Jews. It's always you first in Paul's ministry uh, up to Acts 28. Okay. First to the Jews. Uh, first been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So every city went in, it was you. Then he would turn to Gentiles. Well, what Gentiles? Those that feared God. What Gentiles? Romans 8, saved by hope. Those Gentiles that got to hear the gospel according to the scriptures. On and on and on. Those Gentiles that some of them had turned from their dumb idols. Some of them uh, uh, may have gotten circumcised as the Romans did. It just goes on and on with that. Now watch. For so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I've set thee to be a light of the Gentiles that thou shouldest be for salvation in the ends of the earth. <laughs> Not all of the Jew first going to get it, the Gentiles are going to get it. They're going to get salvation. Now look at verse 48. Uh, 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified uh, the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. And ordained to eternal life is Romans 8. Go to Romans 8 and 1. In Romans chapter 8. All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to its purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed with the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and Justification is not a real big message in Ephesians and Colossians as it is in Romans. And Romans 4, he was delivered for offense, raising up for our justification. And of course, the law and the legalistic side of Acts, justification there was justified from the law and uh, uh, the liberty of it of, of being abolished in 2 Corinthians 3 and, uh, and, and so forth. And the Galatians going out and getting circumcised he said what are you fools i mean you began in the in the spirit now you're only made perfect by the flesh that'd be like somebody who says they trust jesus christ to have died for their sins and buried and rose again the third day and trust that to be saved and go get baptized baptism has salvation implications to it water baptism is salvation in first peter salvation in uh, uh, water baptism salvation in mark 16 and matthew 28 so why would I trust Jesus Christ to have died for my sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that was enough? Why did I go get baptized? I'm saying it ain't enough. I'm saying I got to wash my, my flesh. Then I'm not crucified with Christ. Crucified, buried, and raised a new creature in Christ. I'm not born again. I'm a new creature. And it just goes on and on. That's how people are fooled into thinking that they've got to do something because they're in a place that ain't teaching the truth and they're not growing. If they got saved in there, they got saved by the gospel of Christ. But that's as far as they went, they stayed babes in Christ. And maybe it's your job to make a stand and let somebody know that didn't have anything to do with your salvation and you shouldn't have done it in the first place. I told people that all for 40 years I've been telling them that. I had a man tell me down there in Panama that they they believe uh, the, the guy believed he ought to just get baptized just, you know, in case that was necessary. It's like John Wayne when he's dying, he said, uh, uh, God, he or she wasn't sure about that. And he called a priest in and he wasn't a Catholic to make reassurance that he was going to make. You're talking about unsure about your salvation. 
Folks, unsure is unsure. I am not unsure about my salvation. Jesus Christ died for my sins, according to the scriptures. He's were buried. Rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And if he's raised, I'm not in my sins. And I have been crucified, buried, and raised with him, and am seated in him at the right hand of the Father, sealed with that Holy Spirit. God knows me, and he will never, ever think. And you need that kind of persuasion. You don't need a persuasion that tells you, well, maybe I ought to do some, something else or go somewhere and do something else. That's wrong. You don't need it. The King James is holy and solid, man. It don't lie. And you can go to it and you get the answers if you want to look. And remember, they are foreknown. Well, but look in Romans 11. And I shut up. Romans 11, the reason Paul goes to a Jew first during Acts period in this legalistic time, it is based on the fact that there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And it has to do with the Jews that God saw with the ministry of Saul, who became Paul, the ministry where Paul would show some Jews and not lay on another man's foundation. The Jews scattered around, he would lay the foundation that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He died for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And if they trust, they're sealed. Wow. They're justified from all things, but you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Freedom. They're the liberty. And on and on. Uh, Romans 11, verse 5. Even so, then, at present time also, there's a remnant for election grace. And if by grace, there's no more of works. No more works, they've been doing them. No more work. Work stopped. Work stopped. No more works, lest any man should boast. Uh, I apologize. No more works. Otherwise, uh, grace is no more grace. Grace is grace. Works is work. Grace ain't works and works ain't grace. Not, it's not confusing. Very simple. And of course, you have the real truth of it in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves a gift to God, not a work lest any man should boast. We ain't got time to go into that one. But what we're, what we're looking at is Saul, a young man, how he denied the Lord, kicked against the pricks, and in spite of that, the Lord appeared to him, saved him, and called him. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen, Jerry. That was awesome. Amen. Amen.